So I wonder if you can just keep an eye on that. I'll keep an, I'll try to keep an eye on it too, Jennifer. Um, and I just am asking Yvonne if they can make it before we get started. Okay. All right. Let me see if I can find Dr. Shabazz here. He's here. He is? Oh, okay. Yep, I'm Great. promoting him now. Perfect. All right. Good. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Shabazz. Hello, I may be rejoining by my computer. Looks like we might have worked the worked the kinks out. Great. Welcome, but I'm here. Yvonne. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So let's go ahead and get started then. Recording is going. So welcome everyone to the April 4th meeting of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly. Pursuant to, pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. So before we... Um, recognize some folks that are here with us. I'd like to just go through and make sure that everybody can be heard and can hear us. And can I just, time thank you. <laughs> 304. <laughs> you get me on that one every week, I think. I think I got it right last week. Um, so let's start with you, Dr. Rhodes. I'm here. Excellent. Hala. Yes, thank you. Excellent. Yvonne? I'm here. Thank you. Yep. And Alexis? Here. Dr. Shabazz? So right now we can't hear you, Dr. Shabazz, but I know you're having some technical difficulties. So um, we'll we'll check back in with you. And Paul. I'm here, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, and that's what I wanna start with is um, welcoming you, Paul. Thank you for being here. I would like to recognize a couple other folks as well that are here with us. Um, we have our new Crest Director, Earl Miller is here with us. Um, and we also have, Jennifer, could you just say quickly what Abdallah Galilini does um, if they are also here with us? Yes, he's our implementation project manager. For the CREST program. For the CREST program. Excellent. And then we have our council president, Lynn Greismer here. And let's just quickly... So thank you for, for joining us. Um, just wanted to recognize those folks. And since we are moving pretty quickly here, we have uh, designated an hour for this meeting and we do have another item to cover. We're gonna move right into our first item here, which is a presentation. We're very excited about this. Uh, this is a presentation um, coming from Curry Spitzer and Susan Strait of the Donahue Institute, and uh, they will be presenting the results of the Black African American Census that we've contracted with them for. And so I'm going to bring both of them into the room. I do see Kerry, but I'm not seeing Susan, but let's bring Kerry in and then we'll ask. There she is. Hi, Carrie. Good afternoon. Nice to Hi. see everyone. Um, I know Susan was intending to join us, so um, I, but she may have gotten stuck, um, caught up in some other work. So if it's okay. 
possible for somebody to keep an eye out if she does have the ability to join us. Um, Absolutely. I will keep my eye out and um, I do not see her right now, but um, I will promote her if I do see her. Okay. I'll send her um, just a quick message too. Okay, great. And thank you, Carrie. I want to recognize that Carrie is a former school board committee member and resident of Amherst and now working at the Donahue Institute. And we've been working closely with her and her team. And so I'm going to just go ahead and hand it over to you. Unless, would you like to wait a minute to see if Susan can join us? No, I think we should go ahead. I'm right. going to Perfect. Um, I just sent and her a minute. You need sharing screen. Um, do you can you do you see the ability to share screen? Um, I believe I do. So I'm gonna Perfect. I think I'll just start off with some introductory remarks. I did not prepare prepare a PowerPoint or anything, but I do have the maps available to share with everybody. So I was gonna focus more on how to use um, the tools that we created. So um let me step back a moment, introduce myself. Um, my name is Dr. Carrie Spitzer. I'm a research manager at the Donahue Institute. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Donahue Institute, we do a lot of different things, but um, I'm in the economic and public policy research group. And within that group, um, Susan Street is the pro senior program manager for the population estimates program. So we're the state data center um, for our census data in Massachusetts. Um, so we were approached, um, actually, I think, a little bit before I actually joined the Donahue Institute um, by this group to um, help share the 2020 census data, because we know that you're interested in um, better understanding where the Black and African American population in Amherst lives, and also how that intersects with the student population. And um, oh, Susan had a confusion about the time start. So hold on. Let me She's, she, she should be jumping in right now. I'm, it was probably my fault in telling her it was uh, the wrong time. I'll get her, thanks. All right, so she should be, she said she's gonna jump on now. Um, terrific, so sorry for getting off track. Um, so today what I'll be sharing with you is the result of that project. So we um, are using two data sources. One is the 2020 um, PL94 census data. Um, the other source is the American Community Survey data, which also comes from the Census Bureau, but unlike the, the, the decennial census data, it's survey-based. So it's a five-year um, survey-based estimate for the population. So I just want to um, kind of start off with some basic data about Amherst, and then I'll be sharing with you the kind of more um, smaller lever geography, geographic analysis that we did. So as everybody here probably is aware, um, Amherst has a population of about 39,000 individuals um, as of 2020. And about 23,000 of those residents are students, either in college or graduate school. And um, according to the 2020 census data, data 16,000 of those residents lived in college dorms, um, which by the census, they've often referred to those as also as group quarters. Now, um, for all residents in Amherst, the overall black or African-American population, either alone, meaning that when, you know, when you're asked on the census to check a box for your race, they either checked off um, black or African-American alone or in combination with any other race. So for the purposes of this project, we were looking at the population of the residents <laughs> who either identified solely as Black or African American or in combination with any other race. So for all of the cases where I'm referring to the Black or African American population, that's the, the population I'm talking about. So it could be in combination with other races. Um, so in Amherst, there are 3,450 residents or about 9% of all residents, um, including students who identified as Black or African American. And of those, um, we estimate that about 1,500 um, live in blocks that are at least 90% or more um, college dormitories. And obviously there are many more who are living um, off campus in student housing or in rental housing. So what I'm gonna do now is um, start by sharing the, the tableaus, um, maps that we shared. And I was in conversation with Michelle that these can live um, on the African Heritage Reparation Assembly's website. 
And also they will be hosted on the UMass Donahue Institute's public Tableau website. All right, and I also shared these by email with the folks whose emails I had. So hopefully they can be circulated um, as well. Um, so people can look at, at home at a later date. So what you're looking at here, this is the finest um, geographic level. This is block level data. Um, we have two maps here on the left. And please interrupt me if anybody has a question or if um, I'm Sorry, happy to be interrupted. Can you yep. make this a little bit bigger by any chance? That's what I was just wondering. Um, I can definitely zoom in as we go, like to specific levels. I'm, but I'm not sure I have the ability to make it. Okay, that's I'm no problem. looking for my zoom controls. Um, I wonder, like, if you made this full screen on your browser, would that? It be? is at full screen. It so is. Okay. Yes, yeah, so that's okay. Yeah, if you can just zoom as you go, that would be great. So on the left, um, and, and first off to start, this is all the census 2020 decennial census data. So um, just keep in mind, this is two-year-old data, but um, it's the, the count. So what you're seeing here is at the block group, you can see very clearly for anybody who, who's familiar with town, these dark areas, this is the Hampshire College campus, the um, Amherst College campus, and then you can see UMass over here. Um, you can, as you zoom in, you can select any one block. You can see the total, the count of the population in college housing and the total population. So for example, over here, you can see that over 98 or 98% of the population is located in college dormitories. You can also see the tract number and the block. And the nice thing is if you click on one of these, it'll then bring up on the other side, the, um, the share black or African-American alone or in combination with another race. So you can see uh, in this block here, um, 28 individuals were counted as being black or African-American alone um, or in combination with another race out of the total population of 391. So the share is 7.2%. Um, and as you can see, um, you know, you can, see the map layer underneath with details about where this is in town. If you click on the home button, it should be bringing you back to the full map. But sometimes I find I actually need to refresh <laughs> to get the full map. But as you can see, um, on the college campuses are often darker shaded areas. So if you look at Hampshire College right here, you can see that it is 14.7% of the population living in dorms on Hampshire College is African American or, or Black. I will note, so one of the things to be wary of, if you are like me and you decide to zoom in on your um, census block and look at the population in that area, you're going to see um, numbers that potentially aren't what you expected. And this is because the census uses something called differential privacy to protect the identities of individuals. And so they introduce noise to these estimates to allow for, um, to, or to prevent people from being able to zoom in on the, um, for example, the one African-American family they know on their block and be able to connect that to other data potentially about their household status or their income that the census also collects. So this differential privacy may result in counts that are not what you necessarily would anticipate. So I'd really, encourage anybody using these maps to look at the patterns they see in the data rather than to focus in on the exact counts that you're going to see in the data. The other thing I caution is that since Amherst, you know, is not the most densely populated town, um, you will notice, for example, up in this corner um, with the total population of 10 individuals and six identifying as Black or African American alone, you see 60% of the population categorized as, as um, Black or African American alone in, or in combination with another race. Um, I would just caution that at these extremely low population counts, these numbers aren't 
that reliable. So I would um, look at the patterns overall in town and, and that should be more informative. Um, we have also sent to the team all of this data in tabular format. So all of the underlying data is also has also been delivered to the town. But I think one of the things I'd focus on here is that the population is fairly dispersed over town. So I'm not um, seeing any areas that are particularly, um, I mean, given what we know about segregation in the United States, I'd say that this is not um, an extremely segregated map in terms of you're seeing the, 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 um, the patterns over, over town. I would say that we are seeing a concentration of the Black and African American population on the college campuses, but then some of these other areas where it's particularly dark or very low population counts. So I would say again, because of this differential privacy issue that I wouldn't necessarily um, put too much weight in that. Though there are clearly areas in town um, with a higher share of the population. And I'd also say that there are places here that are represented as having zero um, population as Black or African American. And it's very likely that there are actually folks who identify as Black or African American living in these areas because of that differential privacy issue. So, um, this is the finest grain level of data. And at this level, um, a lot of the other measures that people are interested in aren't available. So we also did um, block group level maps and combined this census 2020 data with data from um, the American Community Survey, which is also put out by the Census Bureau, but is survey data. So there is, there is um, as you find with any survey, there are margins of error. Um, and these maps represent uh, what we, the analysis we did at that level. So um, the indicators that we were asked to look at had to do with, again, because there was a focus on trying to understand how the Black and African American population overlapped with the student population. One of the measures we looked at was the share of the population enrolled in college, and that's on the extreme left. There was also an interest in looking at content excuse me, concentrations of poverty. So we, um, we used 200% of the federal poverty line as our measure. Um, we also looked at the median household income in, um, and this is in 2021 dollars. And finally, again, all the way on the right, we have the share black or African-American alone or in combination with another race. So here, this is a, a larger geographic area. So we have more people, but I would, again, make the same statement that um, this is survey data, so there is some error. So I wouldn't, again, I would not focus solely on the counts or the percents, but more about the patterns across town. Um, that's what I would really focus on. So again, you're going to see the college campuses um, really easy to point out. We've got Hampshire, UMass, and Amherst College. And one thing I'll point out for that, people living in group quarters, um, the census doesn't calculate a poverty rate for those individuals and doesn't collect their um, income data. So that's why over here, you don't see a poverty rate for the college campuses and you also won't see the median household income calculated for those areas. But one of the things, the part of the reason we wanted to um, bring this data in too is that one of the things that happens in Amherst is because we have so many students who are living off campus for whom the poverty rate is calculated, um, it can often make the town look like it has a higher than anticipated level of poverty. And this is true at, in other college towns as well. It's something that's been well documented that college towns often um, appear to have much higher levels of poverty than comparable places. Um, so again, I think you're going to see when, you, when you're looking at these maps, again, the higher concentrations of um, residents represent, um, identifying as Black or African American on the college campuses. But then again, you can see here um, other parts of town. So if you just wanted to zoom in, um, Michelle and I were looking at these earlier. So this block here, right above Hampshire College, um, which includes, let's see, Long Meadow Drive, Glendale. You know, this, you can look here and see the share um, is 14.6%. So that's higher than the town average of 9%. And you can also look at um, slightly higher um, poverty and a fairly low um, share of the population enrolled in college, only 3.2%. So depending on what your group's goals were, you might say like, this looks like a neighborhood where we may want to do some extended community engagement, um, reach out to folks living on these streets and um, 
if you were going to target the African-American population who's non, non-student population living in the area, this might be a good way of kind of identifying a, a, a neighborhood that you'd want to focus in on. Um, let me see. Does anybody have any questions? I'm happy to, um, I think the big thing I, I wanted to point out again is just that with these maps and as with using the census data in general, you know, it's it's the best data we have, but it's it's not perfect. So, um, so I do, after I Shabazz, you, I see questions. I, yeah. I, I will let you call on <laughs> folks though. I know I'm, I'll, I'll see. Either way, it doesn't matter, but yes, I, I saw first Dr. Shabazz and then I saw Hala and then I saw Dr. Rhodes. So uh, let's go in that order. Thank you very much. Close one of these accounts since it's causing problems, but um, I am looking at roughly speaking um, in the day in data from the from the three institutions of higher ed that um, if UMass has roughly about a thousand students who identify as black African American, um, if uh, Hampshire College has roughly 75, let us say, that identify as of African heritage, uh, Black African American, and Amherst College is say 180 something, uh, 180 that identify that way, that's roughly about 1,300. Now, for sure, not all of that 1,300 live in Amherst, reside in Amherst, but that's a sizable number when at the same time, the census data is telling us that the African-American population of Amherst is about 2,000, a little over 2,000 people. So I, I'm really trying to get at if anything from what you have so far helps us to understand how much of the 2,000 or so listed in the census are year-round residents or actually reside um, year-round in the town of Amherst and how many are students? Because right now, by my look at it, more than 50%, close to, well over 50% of the number could be students who are not long-term, uh, do not necessarily, uh, would not count as long-term, long time, uh, long-term uh, Amherst residents. Is there, is there any takeaway from what you've looked that can help us distinguish uh, it, on that account, those that are residents, uh, part of, of Amherst, vote here, are taxed here, uh, and those that are um, not that are, live here more or less nine months, and do not, but do not consider this where they reside. And and I think um, so one one point of clarification because um, I think that's a really good question, but I wanted to make sure because my numbers are going to be a little bit higher than yours when I talk about the Black or African American population, and that's just because the the numbers I'm using here are those who either checked off only the box black or African-American on the census or in combination with any other races. So if I um, checked white and black or African-American population alone, I would have I would have included those folks here. So I have an estimate of 3,450 residents in Amherst who identify as black or African-American alone or in combination. So, but then when I also look at, so what I did um, is we looked at the data um, residents who lived in group quarters, because I think that's the easiest way to kind of pull out those students who are living in dormitories, um, who are clearly, you know, not considering this their permanent residence. They dormitories aren't open over the summer, so there's no way that they're spending the summer here. And so, roughly 1,500 of those 3,450 um, residents are living 
on dorm, in dormitories, either at Amherst College, Hampshire, or, or UMass. So I think you're totally right that we need to, you know, it, it is a sizable share of the population that we're talking about who are students. Now, I think beyond that, I, I'm not, and I'd look to Susan if she has anything to add here, but I, I don't think there's much we can say about whether or not the folks are, lip, you know, it, from the census data, I don't think there's much we can say about their intentions. We can, I, I, you can look at who's enrolled in college or graduate school. And again, it's about half. It's, it's, it, we get at that same kind of ratio. So I think you're right that about half of the, the residents um, counted by the census are students and their connection to Amherst is, you know, I, I can't really comment in, anymore on that other than to kind of call out those who are living in dormitories and I think are clearly you know, not year round residents. Susan, did you want to add anything to that before we move to Dr. Rhodes or to Hala? Um, no, only, well, maybe um, only that um, the different sources never quite fully match up, which is very frustrating for um, people trying to calculate it all out and, and trying to get very specific. I think, you know, the, the closest you can get um, from the census side is using that American Community Survey data. And what I would typically do is kind of look at the college student age, age groups and say, you know, what percent of these are enrolled in college or graduate school. Um, you will have some overlap. I mean, there might be kids who grew up in Amherst who are also enrolled in college or graduate school in the community. Um, to add to that additional confusion, um, some college students don't fill out their form in the proper place. They might fill it out at their parents' home. Um, which could be somewhere in Eastern Mass, even though technically they're living in Amherst most of the time. So there, there are all these kind of like slivers of overlap and confusion, but I do think it is worthwhile to kind of do that second check um, as you have and kind of say, now what do the administrative data sources tell us? And, and just kind of look at them all lined up together and say like, do, is this giving me a reasonable picture? I think that's very smart since you have that data. Thank you, Susan uh, and Hala. Yes, I'm not sure if this is a Donahue question, but I know from my sorry, I, that noise. I know from my lived experience that um the there's underreporting for the census that we use, and then NBR also came out with a report. So would the patterns, Dr. Spitzer, you keep talking about, would that help us to find the families that did not fill out the official census? do you think like that's a tough I'm question to figure out how to get to the families that didn't actually fill out yeah and and so i think the census has has reported that they do undercount um black or african-american populations along with um you know other other demographic groups and overcount other groups and so it's it's it is a it is a, a concern with the data um it's hard to say if, if you assume that the, the uh, people, because I think a lot of the undercount comes from folks, um, some being unwilling to, to report, to, to fill out the census, but other reasons, you know, just people who may be more likely to be renters and therefore moving around more and, and less likely to be counted. But Susan, again, is, is the expert on this. But I guess what I'd be saying, like from a research perspective, I, I guess if you assume that, that un, the likelihood of not filling out the census is evenly distributed across the population, of um, African American or Black residents, and I do think this is, would kind of guide you on where to go. Now, if it, if it were concentrated in certain geographic areas, then um, then it wouldn't necessarily be a, be a good use. And I don't know if we have data to say whether or not um, to say which one of the scenarios is more likely to be the case. Yeah, and I, and I would say you know if if you have local administrative data telling you otherwise. I, you know, I would use that as a rich source of data. So some of the data sources that you might look to would include um, if you have school enrollment data by race and ethnicity um, to do kind of like a comparison. Um, if you have a specific program enrollment data that you can look at, um, we've already heard um, about administrative data from colleges and universities uh, because because certainly there is an undercount among that group. Um, but then if you compare that against, you know, the census count is also used as a control total for the ACS. So you won't get any further comparing the ACS to the census data. Um, 
you know, that it, again, just if you, if you have better local knowledge um, to use, then that, that would be recommended. It's just sometimes getting your hands on, on those local administrative data records, because as they should be, these are also confidential and protected. Thank you, Irv. Um, Susan and Carrie, I really, really appreciate this information. It's extraordinarily helpful um, from my end. And even when I look at the data and I say, well, if I use an error rate of 10, 15%, it's still extraordinary in relationship to the number of students. Uh, so that brings you back to your, uh, a question that because I missed it. Uh, Carrie, when you were um, going through it, in terms of the town as a total, uh, how many residents uh, are there? And out of that number of residents, how many did, of those are students? Sure. So um, the decennial census count for the census was 39,263 residents in 2020. Um, and the I'm going to get the American Community Survey for the number of students because that's the source we have. So again, these aren't totally apples and apples, but that was um, about 23,000 college and graduate students in the town of Amherst. So over half. Yeah, that, that's an extraordinary number um, by any means. And I think that most people in Amherst would find that shocking. Um, but uh, it is something that we uh, really need to be aware of. Now, I think that, you know, given I've, I've been in Amherst a long time, um, that um, when there, there was a time where for economic uh, reasons, uh, Amherst wanted to count those students in, uh, and in terms of our total population for uh, state and federal uh, reasons. And, and those reasons still remain very viable in terms of why uh, that occurred. But it's still um, something that is interesting for all of us um, uh, to be cognizant of is the tremendous amount of impact uh, that the students have here in this town. And obviously with that comes the um, their impact the uh, positive and negative and and also in terms of the contributions that they make to this town um we are a student town thanks irv um i do want to give paul the opportunity to ask any questions he might have but also checking in with yvonne and alexis um do either of you have any questions at this moment, the, you know, maybe still processing. <laughs> okay. Um, so Paul, did you have any specific questions while Carrie and Susan are here? Yeah, no, I think I think uh, Earth's point is really important that the, the census numbers are important to the town in different ways, but that we need to understand who we are in terms of who we are as a town. Um, it's, we don't discount students because they are an important part of our community. Um, and so I think it's always important to recognize that. And also, I just really, you know, it'd be helpful when um, I, I, to see the numbers on the paper and to see the maps a little bit closer. I think that will that's important for me to sort of really grapple with what, what you're coming up with. So thank you for this. Uh, Yvonne. Yeah, I wanted to um, say that the data, thank you so much for sharing the data. It's, you know, it's uh, eye-opening actually I was read, writing some of the numbers and stuff down but you know my personal experience is that a lot of um, black and african-american students come and they stay and so they're enrolled and their kids go like my like which is what happened to me I moved here my you know I got married my kids went to school I ended up being a resident even though I would be enrolled I would have come up as enrolled um, at the time at Hampshire College so and I think that there's a difficult way, there is no real way to get at that unless you're doing a special survey and, you know, kind of gleaning information in that way that Susan talked about, which was a local, local knowledge, you know, and um, some of that um, 
is just happenstance knowledge, you know, like, like, uh, which would, I mean, if we did it as a committee, if we did that kind of surveying as a committee, then it would be about figuring out a way to read that data and have it be um, clear enough, you know, um, concise enough, you know, like we're actually getting at some, but then again, would it be worth it? Like how many, how many people could we, you know, how, how, what a, what a big impact would it make on the data that we already have? You know, so I think those are the kinds of questions that we need to ask. Is it, it you know, would we be able to glean any um, significant impactful new information by doing anything that would be local? Yeah, and I think um, at our next meeting, we'll have the opportunity to talk about what we want to do with this data and maybe put a list of questions together that we might have um, for Carrie um, and Susan. Before I go to you, Herb, I just want to recognize that a member of BAM, which is the Black Assembly of Amherst, Massachusetts, Kathleen Anderson, has joined us. And I also want to recognize that BAM is initially sort of the body that developed this idea of doing the Black census for the town. So um, I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, and, and Irv, please go ahead. Two things I really it really would be helpful to have a summary of these findings, along with the um, added commentary in terms of uh, the um, the issues that uh, could be um, attributed to the data, so that people could look at it. And it. In other words, the limitations of the data, but put put in summary form. Um, you know, we we all can go through and summarize it and. Uh, and do it ourselves. But I think that when we put it out to this town, uh, to the larger population, we really need to have a summary of it. Uh, so everyone can see it at a glance and then put down the limitations of that data. Secondly, uh, I was struck by the fact that, uh, Carrie, when you were presenting some of the information, the neighborhood in which I live, Long Meadow Drive, um, and, and that, that whole area up there, um, that the numbers of African Americans uh, that live there, and, and that is uh, uh, largely uh, single family homes uh, in that area, uh, except for um, uh, a couple of apartment complexes, which was very interesting because that's something that, because I walked the neighborhoods and I lived, I've lived there so long, I've seen these changes over the years. And if anyone came in our neighborhood and walked it, uh, you would be able to uh, see that because you know we have um, uh, uh, you know a number of uh, African Americans who live in that area who are single family homeowners, um, and and it's something that I think uh, was nothing that I was surprised at, but I think that a lot of other people would be surprised at that number. Thank you, Irv. Um, Dr. Shabazz? So I'm on the Donahue uh, Institute's um, tableau uh, for Massachusetts municipal summaries for Amherst. And just wanted to come back to the way you got at this 3,400, three, over 3,400 numbers. So that's adding what you list as Black alone with uh, two or more races where one of those checked in that category of two or more race was, was Black or African American, and as well as some other race. No, that would, that's alone. So basically it's from the Black alone and the two or more races alone where Black was one of the two or more. Is that where you came at, you got to a 3,400 number? That should be, so if you're looking at um, the Donahue uh, municipal summaries, yes, and those are the, um, the races alone as, as versus the races alone or in combination that, that um, because race alone, that on, yeah. because so, race alone, as I see it, uh, is 2,382, is that correct? Black alone count? 
if you're viewing it on the website, yeah, that it would be right. I don't have that number in front of me right now, but it, right. whatever's on the Donahue State Data Center yes. summary yeah. should be correct. And so what and we then, did is, we, oh, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. And then, um, and then you're correct. So then if you, so the person filled out their census form and some people only checked off one block, you know, whether, uh, sorry, one checkbox, whether it was um, black or, or Asian or white, um, some people checked off more than one box. Maybe they checked off black and Asian and white. And so those get counted in the um, black alone or in combination. And then in the, in the dashboard that you're looking at, yes, those, those should have fallen into, as, as you're deducing, those should have fallen into the two or more uh, race categories. Because and where it's... Where it's, it's, I'm looking at, so at 2382 black alone, to get from there to 3400 seems, is telling me that the two or more racist count of 3,636, that the black, that, that those that have black in that two or more racist count is a pretty, would have to be a pretty substantial part of the 36, uh, 36. In fact, at least half, more than half of the 3636 to get us at 3,400 from, from uh, well, close to, close to 50%, maybe not, uh, uh, but, but, a, but a good chunk of that two or more races must actually um, have checked black as one of the, uh, one of the races. That, sound, that sounds about right. I should probably review the way that the Census Bureau did their race coding in 2020, again, because they've changed it um, from 2010, like in, in ways that might not be very um, intuitive and a lot more people ended up in the some other race category as a result of it um, this time. But, but lo logically, the way you're describing it uh, makes sense. And, and uh, the other thing to remember is that um, those race alone or in combination groups for any particular block, they're gonna add up to more than 100% of the people in that block. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. might have you know, 30% black alone or in combination, um, plus another 50% Asian alone or in combination, plus another you know, 60% white alone or in combination. And you, you know, you'll look at that and be like, hey, that's more than all the people, but because of all that, the crossover in, um, the self-reporting. And one other thing in terms of the, in an earlier discussion about the possibilities of this, there was this uh, uh, idea that we could see by different districts or groups, I don't know the exact term, but within the map, we could begin to see where there might be um, uh, concentrations uh, so again, it, it, we, we may not see anything like Evanston in terms of its African-American population being heavily concentrated in one particular district, but by virtue of the different um, uh, uh, cells or, or, or areas that the Amherst, I like to think of it as a rectangle, but the little Amherst uh, rectangle, you mentioned that we might could see in different areas, Was it, is there anything there where uh, for this uh, 2400 20, black alone or 3400 uh, black uh, plus others that we can we can see some areas that are that are more um, heavily populated uh, to to know where we could direct uh, postcards mailings or something like that yeah I, th I think so so um first off you'll see the college campuses are clearly areas of concentration of, of the Black or African-American population. Um, I think what, and I was highlighting, um, you know, that neighborhood in South Amherst on, off of West Street as, as another area um, where the population is higher. Now, I, where the only place I'd, I'd give caution is if you're looking at a block that has a very low population. I just think I'd, I'd be cautious there, but in some of these other blocks, so, um, I could share my screen again. And I want to be conscious of the time too, but um, 
Which and is Carrie, I recall you saying that you might have to leave. What time did you have to leave by? I probably should leave a few minutes before four just to pick up my son from school. But um, so sure. like five up would be good. But um, but so if you look here, um, I, I guess this is where Dr. Rhodes he was saying. Um, oh, sorry, it refreshed on me. Um, but you can select here, for example, this block 4003 off of West Street has a 88 people counted as living um, here who are Black or African American out of a population of 428, so a share of 20%. Now that's above the town average and might be worth um, conducting outreach in that area. Um, I would, though, you know, direct caution if you were going to go up here to this area that has a total population of 10. I wouldn't necessarily say that you should send out um, folks there, but I think if, if, you look, if you go across the town and you look at areas where the population is a little bit higher and you're seeing these darker, so the darker shading indicates a higher share of the population that right. identifies as Black or African American. So hopefully that'll be useful. And final thing, I'm just looking at one thing, uh, another part of your summary where you talk about percentage point change in population share by race and ethnicity. Do I understand it that um, the, uh, so white, uh, not alone, non-Hispanic, we're seeing a percentage decrease in the overall population, but with African-Americans, we're also seeing or can you talk about increasing or decreasing from 2010 to 2020? And are you looking right now at the at the Donahue's website? Yes. Okay. So those estimates, I think Susan's group put together. Um, so maybe I'll let her speak to those. If that's Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, and I actually just want to catch up to where you are. Do you mind if I share my screen so everyone can see what? what you're seeing, uh, if I can find it here. Okay, so are you on the, we have a few different things going on here. Um, on the municipal summaries, is that yes, what you're- Yes, I'm on the, the okay. municipal, with the bar graphs. Okay, so if anyone hasn't seen this, this is a great, <laughs> thank you for this segue to let me showcase this. Um, we have put together uh, summaries looking at population over time, um, here's Amherst, total population, population by race group. Um, and when we say uh, percent point change, so let me just see, oh, page two comparisons is probably where you are. There we go. Great. Okay. So um, percent change in population share by race and ethnicity. So um, not that the uh, Black alone non-Hispanic population increased by 0.9%, but that it went from, let's see where it was before. Talking about its share. Talking about the share that went up. So the share is here, 6.1% um, of the population in 2020. So what that other graph, um, that Dr. Shabazz was pointing to that 0.9% increase in share, that means that it went up to 6.1 from whatever, I guess, 5.2% in 2020. And then if you wanted to kind of dig a little bit deeper, you can look at it in a table format too, um, back to 2000. Uh, here is the, um, the count count in the census, black alone, non-Hispanic. And do we have the shares here? Maybe not. We also have a map, like a statewide map that you can look at where you can look at Amherst on the map. And that's one of the, um, if I can get back to that. Here's one I had it pulled up. So here you can look at the, um, look at the different years. 2000, oh, sorry, 2010 to 2020. Kind of, you can look at it statewide. Mm -hmm. These are these are the race alone groups. Mm -hmm. So you could look at it here. And I mean, one thing that kind of jumps out about Amherst, if we choose like white, just to kind of do the reverse out, um, 
you know, where the darker blue is white alone population, you can see that Amherst is, you know, one of the more diverse uh, towns in the region just by looking at this. Mm -hmm. And while I'm here, do you mind, um, we, uh, Carrie talked a little bit about differential privacy and how you can't, you know, um, if Dr. Rhodes knows how many neighbors live in his block and wants to count them and, and then look at the census and say they got it wrong, you know, just to remember that it's scrambled. And we put a dashboard up to hopefully make it a little bit easier for people to get a sense of like when you say it's scrambled, like how scrambled, um, and we have comparisons by race and ethnicity because for uh, large population groups, maybe it's not scrambled as much as a percentage as some of the smaller groups. So looking at total age, um, if we wanted to look at block, which is what the maps were based on. And then here's the, the mean absolute error. So the difference between the scrambled count and the actual count using census 2010 data, which is the only demonstration data that the Census Bureau will release to us. Um, you can see that uh, you could be um, plus or minus 19 people in a block. That's the, the, to the range and that the average range that you're gonna be off by is 2.6 people. But there could be, if you see a block of 19, um, you know, uh, individuals reported as black alone, you know, it, that could be, that could be differential privacy kind of interfering with this, which is why I think to Kerry's point, you know, if you can move up to kind of a higher level. And now I wish we had put block group here. We didn't, but we do have tracts. Um, you can look at that too. Thank you. Thank you, thank, Susan. Thank you for looking at our dashboard. I appreciate that somebody's <laughs> into it. And Could you keep that up for a minute? And Dr. Rhodes, just it, just I'm going to pause for a second to say, Carrie, if you need to leave, please um, feel free, and we'll follow up with any questions. Also, follow up with you about getting everything onto our Engage Amherst website and our AHRA website. I think what Herb said about an executive summary and limitations of the data might be good things that we that I that we can work on. So sure, um, I put together a memo based on our conversation today, just highlighting the, the points I made today. I'm happy to. And I, I do apologize for having to run, but um no, thank you. Half an hour, but the conversation was very good and I'm available. You all know where to reach me, I think, at least many of people on this call. So feel free to reach out. I'm here. And Susan, thank you so much. And I also want to do a shout out. Um, a lot of this work was done by Mike McNally, our research assistant on this project. So he deserves a lot of the credit. All right. Awesome. Well, take care, everyone. Thanks, um, Carrie. Sorry to yeah. cut out early. Take care. Um, and so I see, I know Dr. Rhodes, you have a question. I also saw that Paul's hand was up previously. So um, I don't know if your question was answered, Paul, in the process there. Yeah, it, it kind of was. I think uh, Susan talked about, I was, I was going to ask about ground truth and some of this information, but you did address it in terms of like if Irv walked around his neighborhood and said, I know what the number is, and, and you answered that. So I appreciate that. Okay, Dr. Rhodes. So Susan, would you go back? to the, the, um, these bar graphs in terms of the town and, um, and the ethnicity. Uh, what was interesting to me was the um, uh, share of the population um, in relationship to the white population uh, from the last census to now in terms of that decreasing. Um, so help me find um, the space that you're thinking about here. Uh, if you go back up to the bar graphs uh, that um, when when you, when you were talking to a mail car, um, it, it, you here there you're you're coming up on it now right there. The percent point change. Right when you well yep. so yeah. Um, what I found interesting was the uh, decrease in the population of whites over that period of time. Yeah, and that's. Um, that's a phenomenon that you're seeing all around the state and perhaps all around the country. And a lot of it is going, um, a lot of it is ending up in the um, 
uh, two or more races or the, the um, some other race, although it doesn't look like it on this, on this particular graph, but um, around the state, you're seeing an, a, a, a pretty significant increase in the some other race alone, which is everything to do from the new way that the Census Bureau is coding responses and also um, some people attribute it to like the increase on like people taking you know DNA tests and you know self-reporting maybe a broader range of, of heritage um, and also just so, uh, the, the census census population by race changes from decade to decade even if the people don't change um, because it is self-reported and people self-reporting also changes over time. Interesting. Thank you. Alexis. Um, I feel a little bit embarrassed asking this. What does it what does it mean, some other race? What is what is that? Can you explain what that even because I see I see races listed here, and then I guess I'm like what in because I'm even confused, and like as someone who has grown up confused about the boxes that you have to check, you know, what, what is the right answer? And, and maybe there isn't one, but like, what is, how should I know if I should check other? Well, again, this, this is like self-identity. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things coming out of the fact that some other race is increasing, it's not that people are getting it wrong. It's more like um, the census, Bureau questions and the OMB categories aren't capturing accurately what what people how people identify themselves, and so they are you know people will write in another response, um, and if the Census Bureau doesn't have it kind of you know a category kind of for that, um, they'll put it into some other race. What's very strange about the coding this time is that. Um, for example, there's, and the Census Bureau has a blog on this. I wish I had that pulled up, but I don't right now. But um, it gets into the, the very detailed on how the coding was done this time around. And um, you'll see that like if somebody put um, white and Cuban, um, they could have been put into some other race or two or more races. Um, they would be put into white, white plus some other race. Whereas I think historically they might have been like, oh, well, the Census Bureau might have said, well, you're you're white, so we'll use white as your race, and then we'll use Hispanic as your ethnicity, because they think of those as two separate categories. Whereas this time around, you you became white and some other race, therefore two or more races. So it's uh, it's a little bit hard to disentangle. But it's a good question, but I can. I can just tell you that whatever you're writing down, there's there's no wrong answer, you know, as you identify. Right, but I guess, and this is the last thing I want to say, but I guess it's like kind of like to what to what extent is it the reality and then your personal feelings? Like my mom can't, like she might feel which is not the case but like she can feel whatever small percentage of white she is but like that doesn't change her like how how she navigates politically and so I guess I'm wondering like is it is it purposeful to entangle ethnicity and race or is it simply that that you want that there is a desire to like broaden what those things mean or like kind of like combine the two like I guess I'm wondering like what to what to what point and like to like to what benefit is it to label Cuban as a race that's a really broad that's a broad question um, that I don't know if I'm the person to answer, you know, for the OMB categories or the Census Bureau categories as, as you know, or the, lo the logic that, you know, these longstanding institutions have put up or have put up now and then 
I, I do know that they're, they're doing research and they have been doing research to kind of keep questioning those categories. I mean, um, it sounds silly, but like in 1850, you would choose uh, which state of Germany you came from on a census form. Obviously that doesn't, that has no meaning today um, as, as the race categories that we're checking off today will probably have very little meaning in the future. Um, so it's just always in, in flux, but then there's this kind of, you know, there, there's the, the human identity that where it begins. And then there's these kind of, you know, administrative institutions kind of catching up and lagging sometimes by decades. So, so that's a very fuzzy answer to a, you know, a question that I can't, can't completely wrap my arms around in a sound bite. Thank you for trying though, Susan. <laughs> that is a complex question. Um, and okay, uh, yes, Yvonne, and I am aware of the time. I know that we had talked about this meeting being one hour. We still have another item to cover and we do have to do public comment. So I'd like to go to Yvonne and then uh, maybe we will thank Susan and uh, wrap this up at least for today. Yvonne? Um, yeah, I'll be really quick because I wanted to comment on what Alexis is saying and just um, for us moving forward as far as what this sense of data, me data means and how we can use it. I mean, um, this data, even though it's um, for purposes of um, tabulation, is also a very political issue. And in lots of ways, I would say, you know, I'm, you know, similar to um, credit reports, which is also a, another really political um, system that can often support systemic racism, you know, uh, you know, meant to not, maybe it's not meant to do that, but it can be that. And so I feel like when we're reading this data, going back to what I said before about like local knowledge as well, and being able to, I mean, often, you know, people of color are not, um, available to fill out the census out there. Maybe they're not the ones filling out the census. You know, they're not even in the tabulations. You know, I think that it's a difficult process for us to figure out how we get at the folks that we want to get at. Um, and using this data, just keeping in mind that often this is skewed against the people that we're trying to reach, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So it will be good for us as, a, as an assembly to really talk about how we want to use this and sort of those layers that have been brought up. Um, so Susan, I want to thank you for being here and for presenting and uh, also um, for answering questions. And we will certainly follow up with any additional questions that we have. Thank you. I'm happy to happy to help and, <laughs> yeah. and and thank you thank you for all of your questions and for for looking into all of this. Thanks. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so we are. I'm going to um, go to public comment right now before we move on to our next agenda item. Um, Paul. Feel free to stay or go, whatever you need to do. I know we have a big meeting tonight. Thank you so much for being here. And um, so I'm gonna read the public st comment statement. Um, during the public comment period, the chair will recognize members of the public when called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name, pronouns and residential address. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the discretion of the chair based upon the number of people who wish to speak. No speaker can cede their time to another speaker. The AHRA will not engage in a dialogue or comment on the matter raised during public comment, but we will be listening intently. So if you have, uh, if you'd like to make public comment, please go ahead and raise your hand and we will um, bring you in. Okay. Um, so not seeing any public comment, but thank you to all of those who attended today. We really appreciate uh, your support and being here. 
and um, please continue to join us when you can. Um, so let's go ahead and move just a time check. We talked about this meeting being one hour. Um, I do want to be sure that we have at least a plan for the Mass Humanities grant because it's due, um, it's going to be due soon. <laughs> Um, so we need to make sure at our next meeting that we've finalized it. And I just want to say a huge thank you to Hala for putting together the draft that you've put together. I hope some of you have had a chance to look at it. It's in the packet. We'll bring it up in a minute, but I just really want to thank you for that. It was so helpful to see all of the questions, what was being asked of us and all the thought that you put into it. So I think we have a great foundation to begin with here. Um, and so Alexis, I see that your hand is raised. Yeah, um, thank you, Hala, so much. You look fabulous, by the way. Um, so I was going to um, work on it um, in these next like two days um, and add things to it. But I guess I was wondering, how do I share this without violating anything? Yeah, so we can't, we have to make a decision about how we want to go about this. So it's now been posted in the packet. Uh, what Hall drafted has been posted in the packet. So I think we have a couple different options. One option is if we want to work on it between now and our next meeting, which I think we need to, um, we will want to schedule a meeting. Um, and I'm going to let Jennifer speak to this, but I think we'll want to schedule a meeting. I don't know that you can work on it. Um, I think you can, what you can do is you can send your comments to myself and Jennifer, and then Jennifer can send those out to the committee. But Jennifer, please speak to that. We could do it that way. I mean, the other thing that could just happen is that everybody could make their comments and send them in and we could uh, try to create one working doc and then have a meeting about it and then move forward from there. Yeah, I think that would be a great idea. So we, we had talked about two pieces. Um, so yeah, this one being a piece that we're all trying to contribute to, and then the community survey questions that we were all going to be contributing to to put together a document. So, um, Alexis, what do you think? Are you comfortable with sort of putting together your thoughts and ideas, and even even editing a document if you want? You can use a track change or whatever, and then just send them to myself and Jennifer and we'll incorporate everybody's suggestions into one document and we'll make sure to give credit where each person's um, you know, feedback came from. That works? Okay. Yes, Great. that sounds good. And I have to bounce, so. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Alexis. Um, so, and Hala, is there any, I just wanted to turn it over to you to, um, talk about this document if you'd like to, um, I can pull it up. Um, if there were any items that you wanted to just sort of get us to weigh in on or that were in particular challenging, um, so would you be okay with me sharing it on the screen right now? Okay, great. Hang on one second. I think I have it here. Let's see. Share. Okay. I think this is it. All right. So um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Hala. Um, I don't know if that's necessary. Uh, I will say, I mean, it's fine, but I've never done this type of thing before. And it really got me thinking about how we can further deconstruct some of these institutions that are like, this feels like a gatekeeping thing, not understanding it, having to Google it and then finding this other document, but that's off the point for now. But eventually I'd like to um, make some of these more accessible 
things more accessible for the community at large. I'm at an 80 acre school right now, so I apologize for the background noise. Um, I just did what the best I could. I made up a budget, but that's not a real budget. I was just, they said it also doesn't have to be completely known for the letter of intent. They're like, you could just have, you're not gonna have some ideas about some of these things. So if anybody sees a whole, like I know Yvonne is amazing at this type of thing. Um, so I would love her and Alexis especially, but I know everybody on this committee has done some of this work too. So just know this is my first go. I was happy to get my feet wet and I appreciate all the feedback that will come forward to make this a great letter of intent. That's all I really have to say, if that's okay. Thank you so much, Ala. Yeah, Yvonne. Uh, hold on. Unmute. Am I going too fast here? I can. I, where? Uh, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, it's hard to see the mute button when you're sharing the screen. Um, what did, I read through it, and I think it's fascinating. You know, Holly, you did a great, great job. I think it's wonderful. It's so clear, and what what the goal is of the project. Um, the only two goals that I see are the things we should discuss. One is that they're going to ask who the people are and how we're getting at the people that we're interviewing. Because mm -hmm. um, they're, you know, you, you're talking specifically that, that this is for honorarium to people for sharing their story. So then the, the logical question is, well, who are those people and how are you getting at them? You know, is there a public for people to, is there an interview process? focus groups are there, you know, so I think we might uh, in not going deep into it, just maybe a comment about how we recognize that there has to be an equitable way at getting at the stories that we're including, right? You know, and I think the other one was about um, money. The, the what what the how we broke down the money. Is that the budget piece? Let's see. Yeah. Because if I Definitely. read through this, that's what I would ask. I'd be like, so, like, who are you interviewing? And then, um, oh, also there was a little bit about whether it was a presentation or a video. There's a little um, gray area about whether mm. it would, and uh, what the end result would be. So maybe we want to flesh that out more and maybe there's more than one um, uh, product. You know, like, well, are, are we applying for a video? Are we applying for a presentation? Mm -hmm. um, is this something that's going to be made available to the public after it's put together or after mm -hmm. it's done? Yeah. So how are we going to how are we going to impact the rest of the community with this thing that we um, create? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I wonder if Hala has a response to that. I also see that Jennifer's hand is raised, I believe. Yeah, I just want to say, so one of the problems that the CSWG ran into was when we wanted to give folks gift cards for participation of the survey and the town cannot do that. Oh. So that ended up happening because we contracted out with seventh generation, seventh gen. And so they were able to do that. And that was included into their uh, contract fees. But I just, I 100% believe that people should be um, compensated for, for contributing their stories and their life and their experiences. Um, but we just have to find a way that we can do that. Okay, that's a good Paul question. And I can talk to him about that and see. Um, I had thought that the um, age friendly and dementia survey included a gift card, but they also worked with a consultant. So there's some Yeah. Okay, well, that's a great we need to ask that question. So I'll, I'll note that. And Hal, I don't know if you had a response to what Yvonne had um, mentioned about sort of the impact piece and being more clear about that. I had just sort of left it open because I thought we were like still figuring it out, even like just throwing in the honorarium because I do think our labor compensation, but yeah, I, I thought we were going to do a documentary, but then I was like, oh, maybe we would have a presentation of the documentary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I, I just, I, 
I was throwing some stuff on there that we could then discuss, which we're doing now, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the budget doesn't add up to the total amount because I don't, this is a, an Alexis thing. Maybe she'll know more about cost because she works in that industry for dog and, um, and you too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think what Dr. Shabazz had suggested last week that we had consensus around was instead of sort of Alexis had brought up the macro micro. And so instead of going for the macro documentary right now, doing some of the micro work. So uh, focusing on these oral histories of maybe four residents um, or former residents um, of African heritage, and then letting that be sort of a, a foundational piece of the bigger documentary piece. And we can- okay, and that, What I was saying documentary, yeah, it was a little piece, a little documentary within a bigger documentary. Like I wasn't meaning the whole, um, it was just the oral history part of the documentary. Got it. Sorry. Okay. That's helpful. Yeah. All right. So what I'm going to ask is that if there aren't any other comments or questions right now on this, if we could send in and think about this, you can send in bullets, you can send in a fully, you know, tracked document with suggestions, you can send in a narrative, whatever is your style, whatever works for you, whatever will encourage and motivate you to send the feedback in, please um, consider that. And we'll want to, at our next meeting, and we'll just talk about that briefly in terms of timing, um, we'll have to really solidify this. So we have basically a week we had talked about at our next meeting also reviewing survey questions. So now the homework has doubled, <laughs> uh, which means um, if you haven't sent in survey question ideas <laughs> this week, um, please also send those in in any way that works for you. And um, even if it means calling myself or Jennifer, um, I know Jennifer's plate's full as is mine, but I'm happy to take a call from somebody um, with ideas and I can, you know, I can jot them down and, and put them in the packet. So whatever works. Um, so we can mail you our feedback and our questions. We have to email either you or Jennifer. Email both of us just so that we both get it, and then we'll work together to put it into a bigger document. The same with um, this uh, uh, humanities. Yes, exactly. Okay, great. Both both would and be great. I just mm -hmm. want to clear something again because part of it was somebody had come in, so I didn't hear the full conversation about the honoranium. Honor, I always say that wrong, so don't. Um, but. If it's coming through a grant and that's part of the grant, then I think that's different. Okay, that's good to know. All right, so if it, if we receive a grant, then um, we can include that is what you're saying and just make sure that's in the budget. Okay. All right, good. Um, so we had talked about meeting next week at 3 p.m. Um, is it possible, and I'm sorry to do this, my son has an every other week doctor's appointment. And so would it be possible to do 315 next week for folks? Any objection to that? Okay. All right, so we'll do 315. Um, Jennifer and I will get an agenda out. And, but basically, you know that the agenda is going to include a finalization of the letter of intent for mass humanities and the beginning of developing the survey questions for our community survey. And um, minutes. And minutes. We will get to those minutes. <laughs> yes. Hopefully, I'll add some more. <laughs> Great. Um, Irv, did you have something to ask? I have nothing to ask. I'm just no, something, to, something to add. Add, to please. Say, just not even <laughs> add, but to say that um, uh, the HRA uh, needs to understand that with this information that's forthcoming and that we've uh, received and reviewed today from the Donahue Institute, 
that that information is a first for this town. Not only, it was, it's not only was it important in terms of African-American community, but the community at large has never seen this kind of data. Uh, there have been large segments of the community have always asked the question, how, uh, what is the impact of students on our population? How many students are even counted in our population? This is the first time this is ever gonna be made public when this goes up on our dashboard, uh, on our website. Yeah, thank you for really like bringing that into full awareness because it's absolutely true. And I can say that when I have talked about it and in particular, and I'd love to share more details about the reparations conference I went to in DC this weekend, but this is a model that other communities can use and can learn from because um, our process isn't going to be perfect. And I really just want to thank you, Dr. Rhodes, for initiating the contact with Carrie and the Donahue Institute and sort of realigning us when we needed it and um, pushing us forward with this, because I do think that it's a, a really fantastic piece of our work. And um, and as you said, something that has not ever been done. Right, and, and the council, the council will applaud us for this work. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, I'll let them know tonight. At the, I've already, you know, we had counselors here today, which was really nice. Um, I don't think I got to mention that Anna Devin, Devlin Gothier was with us. Um, she had come in a little bit later after I recognized and also Dorothy Pam um, was here today. So I'm really happy in addition to Lynn and Paul, that was great to have those folks with us. Um, so, all right, are there any other questions or comments? Okay, then I'm going to move to adjourn the meeting at 4.24 PM and thank you everybody for everything. Thank you everyone, bye. Bye.